We have Dan Hinch giving a talk called KiCad PCB Design for Rapid Prototyping. Dan Hinch is the founder of Rheingold Heavy, an electronics education and product development company. He spent 20 years tinkering with electronics and has done so professionally for the last five of those. He has created a variety of methods, methods for testing designs as quickly as possible because he screws up a lot. Please welcome them to the stage. Hello, everyone. I am Dan Hinch. I am the founder of Rheingold Heavy. And I need to, I usually walk a lot when I talk, so it's going to be kind of difficult to stay stuck in place, but I'll do my best. Uh, so some quick background. I have about 20 years experience just screwing around with electronics, uh, the last five of which I've been doing the screwing around professionally. Uh, and I primarily focused on electronics education, product design, and manufacturing. Uh, Three years, though, of that has been uh, very heavily involved as the resident engineer at the Supply Frame Design Lab doing product prototyping, where I'm basically trying to extract concepts that people have in their heads and turn them into physical realities. And what I'm going to talk about here is the sort of the process that I go through and some of the techniques I've used in KiCad to, uh, to help uh, make that a reality using something called isolation milling or PCB milling. You can see this example that I have right here which is a, uh, it's a pair of inductors because I screwed up on this design and didn't have enough inductance for this particular boost converter. These were some high watt uh, ultraviolet LEDs and uh, they just weren't giving me the amount of, of ultraviolet flux that I was expecting and it turns out I just wasn't getting enough inductance into that boost circuit to actually give me the current to drive it. Uh, so yeah, one of my better bodges right there. Uh, can I get a quick show of hands? Uh, who here has, uh, has actually done PCB layout before? That's what I expected. And who here is familiar with, uh, with machining technologies? Wow, that's actually a lot more than I was expecting. That's cool. So uh, for me, rapid prototyping, uh, just to do some quick definitions, uh, is just reducing the half-life uh, as you go through each iteration of your design from concept to production. So in my case, you know, if it takes me five hours to do the prototype, then the next prototype should be two and a half hours, et cetera, to try and get that shortened up so that you wind up at product a lot faster with a lot more reliability. Uh, when I say copper clad and PCB blank, those are interchangeable phrases. That's the actual chunk of, of substrate with copper foil on top of it that you wind up sticking into your milling machine. A thou is the same as a mill is the same as one one thousandth of an inch, or for those of you that aren't on the imperial side, it's 025 millimeters. Uh, if I say a tenth, that's a tenth of a thousandth of an inch. So very, 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 very tiny measurement, or 0 0.0025 millimeter. A tool is the thing that you actually cut with. So if I talk about tooling, I'm talking about uh, end mills or engraving bits. The tool path is the path that the tool actually follows that you define inside your CAM program. Post-processing, I put here that it's the, the, the act of actually generating the G-code file. It can also mean sort of like after making the board things that you might do to it, like sanding it to get some of the deburring off or to deburr the burrs. The spoil board is the sacrificial work surface. That's the thing that, uh, that you actually can uh, stick your board down onto so that when you do go and do your edge cut, uh, you need to get all the way through your board and there's got to be something underneath it and you want that to be sacrificial so that when you cut into it to make that final pass at the bottom, you're not destroying your end mill in the process. Uh, Workpiece is your part, it's the PCB that you're milling. Indication means uh, trying to get some really precise alignment of your board in some way that I as the fool am taken out of the equation. Uh, there are different ways of doing that we'll, that we'll talk about. And then finally, isolation milling is the act of PCB milling. So that's referred to uh, uh, either way, isolation milling or PCB milling. I'd originally intended to do a demonstration of this at the end of the talk, but sort of limited to 30 minutes. I don't really have the ability to do that. That said, uh, Sean from DigiKey is in the classroom and he has a couple of these milling machines here. Uh, running exactly the same software and using the exact same equipment that I use in my lab at home. Uh, so if you want to see this stuff up and running, I've got like a 20 second video at the end, but you can go in there and get hands on with it and get a better understanding of that. So some very quick theory. Uh, 
The copper clad, the PCB blank, is a thin layer of copper foil that's sitting on a substrate of either FR1 or FR4. FR1 is a cellulose fiber that's bonded together with a phenolic resin, whereas FR4 is fiberglass that's bonded together with epoxy resin. I have no idea what the difference is between phenolic and epoxy, but apparently there's a big one. Uh, there is half ounce copper foil and one ounce copper foil. Uh, in terms of importance for this particular subject, half ounce copper foil is seven tenths uh, thick, so super, super thin. If you cut down one thou into your, your PCB blank, you are through your copper layer. So it's very hard to just sort of burnish the top. You're either cutting it or you're not cutting it. And then one ounce copper foil is obviously twice as thick as that. It's about 1.4 uh, thou in thickness on top of the substrate. What you are going to be getting, for the most part, if you get into this, is going to be boards that are made out of an FR1 substrate uh, with half ounce copper on the surface. Uh, you don't particularly want to use FR4 uh, for this because FR4 is fiberglass, and fiberglass is really, really difficult to cut. Uh, it will wear down your tooling very, very quickly because cutting through glass as opposed to cellulose is incredibly abrasive. Uh, also, the dust that it creates, you don't want to breathe glass fibers into your lungs. I mean, you don't want to breathe any of this stuff into your lungs, actually, but glass in particular is nasty stuff. So, uh, from the tooling standpoint, uh, two flute flat end mills are the, the workhorse of, of this process. Flutes are the actual cutting edges of your tool. Uh, using two flutes as opposed to a single flute or a three or four flute end mill, Two flutes are great. They've got good chip evacuation. They don't heat up too bad. Uh, we also use engraving bits, though, and these are not sort of like, you know, 90-degree chamfer bits that you're using to, to hog out material for a sign or a V-bit. Uh, these are incredibly precise 30-degree engraving bits that have a, a, a nose radius, a tip radius of at most five thousandths of an inch. If you can, get them at three thousandths of an inch because then you'll be able to get even finer lines. All of the tooling that you're going to use is going to be carbide. I haven't actually seen any of these things. They're usually classified as mini or micro bits in high-speed steel. So chances are it's going to be carbide anyway. Uh, and they do sometimes offer them with coatings. So uh, in the machining industry, uh, titanium nitride and aluminum titanium nitride are very common, but those are exclusively used for steel and for other ferrous material. They have no business being in this uh, in sort of this realm of machining at all. However, uh, there are some uh, coatings that involve sort of diamond, crystal and diamond, diamond-like coatings uh, that are applicable because those are specific for cutting through composites. So carbon fiber, fiberglass, the phenolic uh, bonded cellulose. Um, the phenolic, though, isn't all that abrasive, so you don't necessarily need to go down the road of using like a DLC coating, a diamond-like coating. Uh, but those are available if you need them. You absolutely will need them if you are going to mill more than maybe two or three linear inches of FR4 because that, that high speed, or not the high speed steel, but the carbide is going to wear down on the cutting edges awfully fast. Uh, there are some tool manufacturers that really specialize in this. Data Flute is one of them. Uh, I've also seen some good data or some, some good data sheets on tooling from Amana Tools and from Harvey Tools. Harvey Tools in particular, regardless of whether you're talking about uh, milling PCBs or milling giant blocks of titanium, all of their documentation is excellent. If you ever want to just learn about tooling, go to Harvey Tools. They, they just write really, really good white papers on that. And then I found this company, Midwest Circuit Technologies, mctinfo.net, and they have just uh, an entire site that you can get lost in that talks specifically about uh, tooling and different materials and different coatings and different tool geometries for the PCB milling industry. So I, I highly recommend checking them out. This is something that you really want to get into. What you're going to wind up using though, for the most part, are carbide, two flute, flat end mill, so not a ball end mill, but a, a flat end mill, uh, or a 30 degree engraving bit. And if you do need to mill FR4 for whatever reason, you're going to want to get some kind of coating on there, uh, like diamond-like coating. Uh, and just be very careful about the, uh, the swarf, the dust that comes off of there. 
From the machine perspective, I use a, a Bantam Tools Other Mill. It's back when Bantam Tools was Other Machine Co. I have the version two, which was their first retail version. Uh, now it's the Bantam Tools Desktop PCB Milling Machine. Um, the control software is a major plus for this particular piece of equipment, particularly if you're not familiar with machining and you don't want to go down the route of uh, making a whole bunch of CAM files, they take a lot of that headache out for you. All you have to do is basically take your Gerbers, in fact, I think you can take a .kicad PCB file and just drag and drop it into their software and it will do all the tool paths for you. And then you can kind of change around on the margins as to which tools you want to use, whether you want to use some nice big tools to try and hog out a lot of material, do some isolation that way, or whether you need to use an engraving bit, but it does all of the optimization for you. So it'll only use the smallest tools for the things that the smallest tools need to be used for, and then you can step up to larger tools that are capable of taking you know, sort of you know, more abuse in terms of, of uh, cutting forces. The only problem that I have with that software is that when you decide to save that file for later use, it saves it as a compiled file. So it's not just plain text G code. I can't go in there and see what their speeds and feeds are. I can't go in and optimize it myself. It just comes out as gibberish, which is kind of a pain. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. The, the machine itself has a repeatability of one thousandth of an inch, so I'm, I can go from point A to point B and back and forth again uh, to within one thousandth of an inch of where my, my target point is over and over and over again. Uh, the backlash, uh, so the, you know, the gear train or whatever it is, their, their ball screw in there does have a backlash of two thousandths of an inch, which is really good for something that's only this big and costs thousands rather than tens of thousands of dollars. It's got a spindle speed 16,400 RPM, which is what you really need for these tiny little tools. Uh, and my version has a max feed rate of 60 inches per minute. I think the, the desktop PCB milling machine has a, actually 100 or 110 inches per minute for a cutting feed rate. Plenty of other uh, retail options available. The X-Carve, Shapeco, uh, the Nomad, uh, any number of different ones that you can buy off of uh, Alibaba or Amazon or eBay. Uh, but generally, you want to make sure that you're getting good repeatability statistics and good backlash. Uh, you need at least 15,000 RPM in that spindle and, uh, and an enclosure, if at all possible, because this does create very, very fine powdery dust that you don't want getting into the environment. And you are going to wind up having to use CAM software then. So you're going to have to use flat CAM to generate tool paths that you can then wind up loading into the control software for that machine. And their control software isn't going to do any of that work for you. It's just going to be an interface for actually moving X, Y, and Z and spinning the spindle. So I, I couldn't figure out where else to put this. And I realized this is the single most important thing that I could impart to you, which is if you're going to use a, a single sided piece of copper clad and you're going to be using through hole parts when you design your board do it all on the bottom copper layer because what you'll do is you'll wind up milling that bottom side copper and then you flip the board to stuff your parts into it and if you do like i used to and you put it all on the top copper layer when you flip the board now all of your components are backwards and you stuff the things through and you wonder why the magic smoke got released so single bottom layer board for when you're doing through hole components. I actually have an example of this board down here. Uh, you can see me after the talk and I'll be happy to, uh, to show this off. Create a couple of libraries that'll have footprints that are compatible with the milling process. So this generally means uh, having larger annular rings around through hole components. Uh, you can have uh, longer uh, uh, pads on, on surface mount components that'll allow you to sort of get in there more easily to solder. One of the drawbacks of soldering onto this copper clad is that there is no solder mask to speak of. So uh, between having as much isolation as you can get and, uh, and using a lot of flux, uh, you can actually solder down to SOT23 components. I've soldered QFN components. I've soldered uh, quad flat pack components. It can be done. It just takes a lot of flux and some some thinking through the, uh, the, isolation pro uh, the isolation milling uh, that you wind up doing. Uh, but generally, the more copper that you have around your through-hole components, the more reliable that's going to be. Uh, and if you can avoid through-hole components at all, it makes single-sided design a lot easier. If you can stick with SMD, then, uh, then that whole bottom layer, top layer confusion sort of goes away. 
But as you start developing this, these footprints that you wind up using, just stick them in a library called cnc.pretty or something like that, so that you know you're always pulling uh, more reliable footprints out of there. When you're actually in the layout process, uh, set up your design rules for success for the PCB milling process. Uh, it does mean massive clearance, right? So in, in this case, if you're going to use a 132nd inch end mill, and tool changes are the biggest pain in this entire process because they, uh, they just take a lot of time. And you have to take the tool out, you got to put the new tool in, you got to re-zero it, you got to spin the spindle back up, you got to recut, and then you got a new, another tool change, you got another tool change. If you can avoid tool changes, it speeds up the entire process. And the whole point of this is speed. It's not trying to do, trying to do cost savings. What you're trying to do is get to the finished design so you can start testing as fast as possible. So uh, I've standard, standardized on a 132nd inch end mill, uh, which is 0 0.03125 inches. Uh, so if I can get my traces that far apart, that means a single pass with my cutting tool is gonna go right down between them, and I don't have to do any more isolation than that. I'm doing my clearance, and I'm defining my traces all at the same time. Uh, if you do wind up having uh, vias on your board, try to make them uh, large enough so that you can use that 132nd inch tool to get through there. Uh, now, the problem with that is that you do have to wind up hand soldering those vias to connect the, the sides of the board. So, you know, trying to get an, uh, you know, a piece of cut off LED lead jammed in there and soldered on either side in a hole that big can kind of be a pain, but those are sort of the, the drawbacks that you have to deal with. Uh, I found a 10 mil trace width to be absolutely reliable. Uh, you don't have any problem with that. Uh, you can route it pretty much anywhere. You can get through most uh, most paths on your board, so you know, sort of between the pads on an on an 0805, uh, you can you can run a 10 mil trace through there. Uh, if you get smaller than 10 mil, it's not whether or not the machine can cut it. It tends to be whether or not that copper is going to delaminate off the board because there's just not enough glue left underneath that foil to keep it down there, and you wind up seeing these sort of wispy hairs coming off the board. But if you stick at 10 mil or greater, you're going to be cool. Uh, there are some design constraints. There's no silk screen. There's no through hole plating. There is no solder mask. Uh, however, you can engrave text. So put some text into the copper layer where you need to have information that's reliable. If you look on the right hand side here, I've got the five volt, I've got ground, and I've got clock latch and data listed right there in the copper so that I didn't have to use a Sharpie or anything, but you can use a Sharpie to, to mark that stuff on there. Uh, I would also recommend uh, separating your, your voltage and your supply voltage and your ground as far away from each other as possible. Put as many pins in between them so that you don't short them out when you're doing your soldering. Uh, you do wind up having to hand solder the vias and, uh, and that's where that big annular ring comes into play because you can now solder on either side of the board if you have traces running to the top and then traces running off the bottom. Just put a blob of solder on the top of the pin, flip the board, put a blob of solder on the bottom, and you're good to go. Isolation, uh, which is the act of actually milling away the copper on either side of your traces, does act as sort of a pseudo solder mask. So uh, that will allow you to get into some sort of fine pitched areas without the solder blobbing all over the place. Um, and the solder does act as a wick. So if you have, uh, I, I call it fanning the traces out. So if I've got, you know, sort of four pins coming off the side of my SMD part, the, I'll try to lead the trace in here, I'll lead the trace in here, and then sort of at angles in here. And then I get good separation on those traces as they're coming into that fine pitch part. And then when I solder it, I can actually wick the solder away from the pads and that keeps the bridging down to the absolute minimum. There are some solder mask and plating solutions out there. Uh, I haven't played with any of them myself and I was just told about uh, at underscore MG underscore on Twitter. He just did some amazing work with using uh, UV cured solder mask on top of the board and then using fine Z depth control to just mill the solder mask away from the pads. And you wound up with these boards that look uh, professionally made. They, they look really, really, really handsome. Uh, so some examples. I like to design by subsystem. Uh, the PCB milling process is not the process that you want to use 
to do an entire design, right? If you've got something that's gonna take up a full four inch by five inch piece of copper clad, chances are you should be talking to Drew at Osh Park about getting a full board actually spun for you. This is good for testing a sensor, for testing a new power circuit that you haven't dealt with before. If you've got a new micro that you wanna write some code for, but you're not quite sure, just do up a quick design, throw it onto the mill, do some quick testing of it, and, uh, and now what you have is a library of defined circuits that you know work that you can now sort of cookie cutter into other designs as you go along in the future. Uh, this right here on the left hand side is a, uh, is a boost converter that I was working with uh, and then that fed into this microcontroller in the middle and then on the right hand side were some really awful WS2812 side fire LEDs that I never recommend anybody to work with because the pin pitch on those things is awful. Trying to put those things down is like having a tube sitting on top of another tube and then trying to get it to stay still so you can actually solder it. Uh, this is uh, enclosure. So on the left hand side it's a sort of cute, uh, happy cat toy-like thing that one of the engineers I was working with designed, and we had to put a stack of three PCBs inside of there. And there, there are no flat surfaces in there. It's all organic curves, so there's not even a constant radius. It's all decreasing radii and increasing radii. So what we had to do was basically take that CAD model and then slice it at the layers that we knew the PCB would be at, and then take, the, uh, then take a snapshot of the enclosure, of the solid body of the enclosure at that layer height, create a sketch in Fusion 360, and then you project the outline of your enclosure at that layer height, and then just do an offset of, you know, 50 thou or 75 thou or whatever you're, you're comfortable with, and then you can export that as a DXF and import that DXF into KiCad as your, as your edge cut layer, which in our case would actually bring the, the drill holes that we needed along with it. So uh, it went from being a really complex question of, oh my God, how are we gonna do this, to being a really, really simple solution that was really quick to test. Because we could just throw a piece of copper clad in there, mill it up in about you know, 35 seconds just to get the outline done, and plop them into the enclosure to see whether or not those things would line up. This is a, a high current design I did. This was running a heating element. Um, clearly, I got something wrong. If you look at the third one from the left, uh, that thing got super toasty, super fast, and it, I think I didn't use the calculator uh, correctly and probably didn't get the copper thickness correct. I probably did it for a regular board on FR4 rather than for copper clad, and it burned up immediately. Uh, it didn't pass go or anything. It just went whoosh and, and fried up. Uh, you can see like the bubbling as the, as the bonding was starting to release. So I went on Twitter and I said, uh, what's the possible solution to this? And people said, well, what you just flood the traces with copper or flood the traces with solder and that acts to, to help carry the current. So on the far right is the final example where I first I practiced on this one. Uh, to see if this would actually work. And it turns out that isolation milling really let the solder flow onto the traces. And I mean, this was satisfying to do because there was no concern about whether I'm gonna bridge. I mean, it's just as much solder as I could get onto that trace and just run it all over that thing from point A to point B. Uh, very, very satisfying. And then it wound up working. That was running 12 volts, five amps to a, to a heating element. Uh, and I mean, I, it almost didn't even need that, that heat sink on there. It was really impressive. Uh, and then these are sort of the final examples I have. Uh, these are just test jigs, which are really easy to put together. Uh, on the left-hand side, that is just for some breakout boards that I sell, uh, so that when I get them back from the PCB manufacturer, I just, you know, plop them in, run the test code, pull them out, plop them in, test it, pull it out. Uh, I've got a couple of wires soldered on there so I can hook up oscilloscopes to it or a signal generator so I can inject the signal and then test it on the output. Uh, the other is, I guess that's not a bed of nails, it's more like a, a bed of cups test jig with uh, pogo pins for testing uh, Arduino shield headers for a company that I work with, and then a, uh, an ICSP adapter. Uh, like all of this stuff is just like, oh man, how am I gonna program this? I don't have the exact header for it. Well, I can just make it myself and I can make it 
in a, in a couple of minutes. And if it doesn't work, I can just tweak the design and I can have the revised design a couple minutes after that. Again, I'm not trying to save money, I'm trying to save time. I'm trying to go from point A to point Z in as least amount of time as possible. So some, some more quick tips here. Uh, again, standardize on a 132nd inch end mill or whatever end mill is, uh, is your, your cutter of choice. Try to keep a separate tool exclusively for cutting your traces. At least in the Bantam software, uh, you can specify that you are going to be cutting copper or you're gonna be doing through drilling or you're gonna be doing the edge cut layer. Uh, so just turn off all of the drills and all of the edge cut and just do your traces and save a tool for that. Just put a little you know, pink tag on it saying, I use this only for cutting copper. And that way you know that tool is only cutting a couple thou of phenolic and copper foil and that's it. So it's never going all the way down into the phenolic and it's never touching the spoil board ever. Uh, don't forget to swap out your, uh, your, your engraving bit to the, uh, to the actual two flute end mill. Uh, when you start to do your drilling, you will have a very bad day. I don't recommend using drill bits. Uh, there's a couple videos I've seen where people are using these really super tiny, like, you know, 0.5 millimeter drill bits, and you've got no way of pilot drilling those, so when it comes down onto the copper, it just walks all over the place. You're going to get three drills done, and then the thing's going to snap. Uh, so use an end mill and just uh, bore your way in. If you're going to flip the board, use some sort of positive identification. The Bantam Tools has a uh, bracket that you can use. And, uh, and that's really easy. If you're gonna wind up using flat cam, they have a way of adding identification pins uh, or indication pins that you can use. Test, 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 test. That's really the way of getting this done in an efficient manner, is making sure that you've got some way of testing what you think you're gonna do before committing it to a design. And then uh, if you wanna prevent the oxidation that does occur on top of the board, uh, conformal coating. You can buy it in a spray can from MG Chemicals and just give it a quick little uh, blast with the conformal coating, and, uh, and that'll keep it from getting sort of the fingerprint oxide that uh, starts to build up on there. Um, I actually covered most of this stuff here. Um, anyway, that's it, yeah. So Dan Hinch, Wrangled Heavy. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be at the back. My time is up now. So uh, thank you very much for listening.